Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. I believe that the word of God is the most powerful thing that exists in the earth. Jesus is the word made flesh. So when we approach the word of God, we need to do it with reverence and with our full attention. The word of God is not ordinary plain words, but they're words that are packed with life-changing power. And I believe that when the word is preached, that miracles are available to change lives, to save, to heal physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And I just want to encourage you tonight while I'm preaching and really all weekend, I don't want you to come and just kind of sit there to kind of just wait to see what's going to happen. You know, I want you to be expecting God to touch you. And if you have sickness in your body or pain, I want you to be expecting healing. I want you to expect. I believe Psalm 107.20 that says he sends his word and heals them. You see, I don't think, yes, we can lay hands on the sick. We pray the prayer of faith and the sick are healed. But I actually believe that just as the word is being preached, that people can receive physical healings. We've had it happen other places. And I tell you, I got my faith out that while the word is being preached, that people are going to receive all kinds of emotional healing, deliverance from addictions and bondages, Broken hearts healed, sickness and disease healed, pain leaving your body. We serve a mighty, powerful, miracle-working God. Amen? And God is a God of fire and power, not lifeless, dead, and cold. He doesn't bring us a bunch of dead, dry religion. I thought during worship, you know, because we draw people from every kind of denomination imaginable and some people who haven't made up their mind yet which one they're going to be in and some who don't want to be in any and on and on and on. I know when you come to a conference like this and you're in the middle of a mighty outpouring of people worshiping God like we were tonight, maybe you've never seen anything like that and you're like, what in the world? Oh, what is going on? You know, but truthfully, you knew in your spirit that it was right and good. And the point is, is that people here tonight are excited about Jesus. And we should be excited about Jesus. Somehow or another, we think it's all right to spend our emotions on every other thing in the world except God. And when you get a little bit emotional about God, people start going, fanatics, emotionalism, you know, uh, Pentecostalism, those weird people. Well, you know what? I'd rather be a little bit too hot than icy cold dead. So we try to err on the side of letting God be God, and I just want to challenge you to be expecting all weekend. Come expecting. Don't just come and plop down like a dead fish and sit there and wait to see what's going to happen. I got my faith out. I'm prayed up and ready, studied up and ready. Now I want you to put your faith out. And so I pray for you in the name of Jesus that whatever you need in your soul, in your spirit, in your body, in your mind that there's miracle working power here tonight to bring that to you in Jesus name amen all right now thoughts always go before actions I always say that where the mind goes the man follows and I think that's very true.
The Bible teaches us in Romans chapter 8, verse 5, that those who are according to the flesh and are controlled by its unholy desires have set their mind on and pursue those things which gratify the flesh. So it's, it's very plain right there. If you're walking after the flesh, if I'm walking after the flesh, it's because I put my mind on fleshly things and therefore that's what I'm pursuing. <laughs> Whatever we put our mind on, that's what we're going to go after. Our mind affects our emotions. What we think comes out of our mouth. It affects all of our actions. Then it goes on to say, but those who are according to the Spirit and are controlled by the desires of the Spirit set their minds on and seek those things which gratify the Spirit. Now let me just say this, you cannot have a fleshly mind and have a spiritual life. <laughs> it's not going to work. So we have to learn how to think things on purpose that are going to benefit us. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. One translation says, or so does he become. The Bible teaches us, especially in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, that there's a war going on, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations, reasonings, theories, and every proud and lofty thing that exalts itself against the true knowledge of God. Those scriptures are talking about the mind and how there's a battle that rages in the mind. The mind is the battleground where Satan tries his level best to take control of our lives. Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came, and I'm so glad he did. I came that you might have and enjoy your life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. Every one of you has a blood-bought, Christ-paid-for, God-ordained right to enjoy every single moment of your life. We are not here for misery. We are here to enjoy our lives. Amen? And the devil doesn't want us doing that. He doesn't want happy Christians because happy Christians are likely to infect other people with their joy. As long as all the world sees is sad, saved people with bumper stickers and a little Christian jewelry, it doesn't say a thing to them as far as suggesting that they might consider wanting what we have. So whether you know it or not, joy is not only, it doesn't only just feel good, it's very necessary. It's the best advertisement that we can have for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Especially when you can go out and be happy when maybe all your circumstances aren't happy. So the devil didn't just start to work on any one of us yesterday or this morning. He's been at it a long, long time. But we have weapons. Thank God that we have weapons. And the weapons all involve the Word of God. Tonight when we were worshiping God, that was a weapon. We were doing spiritual warfare tonight when we were worshiping God. The Word that I'm preaching tonight is fighting demonic spirits and breaking strongholds off of people's lives. When we hear the Word, speak the Word, meditate on the Word, sing the word, when we praise God, all of these things are weapons that defeat the enemy. Now the Bible teaches us that our mind has to be renewed. And we're going to talk a lot about that tonight. The devil is a liar, the father of lies. He has carefully studied each one of us for a very long time. But I guess my point is, and my question to you is, how long have you studied him? How quickly do we recognize an enemy attack? How long do we put up 
with the devil's nonsense before we even bother to say, I know what you're trying to do and you're not going to do it. No matter what lie you tell me, this is what God's word says and that is what I believe. How long do we just put up with the enemy tormenting us? How many days do we have to be in a fit of depression and full of self-pity before we say, oh, I think I'm under enemy attack. <laughs> Don't wait till you get so bad that it takes a truckload of Christians to come and prop you back up again. <laughs> Let's learn how to do what the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, resist the devil at his onset. Immediately, no, get behind me, shut up, you're a liar, that is not true. And I personally am very big on speaking out loud. I think if you're in a place where you can, you can talk back to the devil. Jesus talked back to the devil and there's no reason why we can't. He's our example. You say, well, when did he talk back to the devil? In Luke chapter 4 and other places. The devil begins early in our life by bombarding our minds with cleverly devised patterns of little nagging, nagging thoughts. Suspicion, doubt, fear, wonderings, reasonings, <laughs> theories. He moves slowly and cautiously. After all, well-laid plans take time. A stronghold is an area where an enemy entrenches himself and controls that area. And so when the Bible talks about how we have strongholds in our mind, we have to understand that that's an area where the enemy, Satan, has worked a long period of time and he now is entrenched in that area and he's caused us to believe something that is absolutely not true. However, as long as we believe it's true, no matter how untrue it is, it's true for us. And of course, I had many things in my life that I firmly believed that were absolutely untrue but I did not know they were not true because I did not know the Word of God. I wonder if we have any idea how precious the Word of God is. I'll tell you what, I thank God for what I know. Oh my goodness, I would not take anything for the 37 years I've been studying the Bible. I thank God for what I know. The more you know of the Word, I mean really know, the less likely you are to be deceived. The devil doesn't want you to study. He doesn't want you to be here tonight. And he'll try to do everything he can to distract you because he doesn't want you to get anything out of this. But you don't need to be too concerned because I've already prayed and you are gonna pay attention. Period, end of the conversation. And you don't want to go to sleep in here because we have people that will come get you. <laughs> so with these weapons that we have, strongholds can be torn down. So we see so far that we're in a war. Why else would we be called soldiers? In the army of God. <laughs> Soldiers and armies are for war. So we're in a war. Our enemy is Satan, not people. <laughs> we war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. And I know, you know, we don't like, yeah, I don't know, Joyce. I, I'm not real comfortable about all this devil talk. He's deep, you know, that, that kind of spooky. <laughs> well, <laughs> would you rather spend the rest of your life deceived and miserable? Or would you like to face the truth that you have an enemy, you don't need to be also concerned about him because God is much greater than he is, but neither can you ignore him. <laughs> Jesus did not ignore the devil and we cannot ignore him either. Our mind is the battlefield. The devil works diligently to set up strongholds in our mind. He takes his time 
to work out his plan. So now we're going to examine a little bit about how this plan works by me sharing a parable with you. And it's not a parable that Jesus told. This is my own parable that I made up. And it's in this book, Battlefield of the Mind. And so you're just going to have to indulge me and let me read you a little story here. Mary and her husband, John, are not enjoying a happy marriage. <laughs> there is strife between them all the time. They're both angry, bitter, and resentful. They have two children that are being affected by the problems in their home. Strife is showing up in their schoolwork. The results of the strife in their home is showing up in their schoolwork and their behavior at school. One of the children is now having stomach problems because of his nerves. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, I'm Mary and I'm married to John. <laughs> Many of you can already recognize where this is going. Well, Mary's problem is that she doesn't know how to let John be the head of their home. She's bossy. <laughs> she wants to make all the decisions, handle the finances, and discipline the children. She wants to work so she'll have her own money because she is independent, loud, demanding, and a nag. So you're probably thinking by now, well, I've got Mary's answer. She needs to be saved. She needs to know Jesus. Well, guess what? She does know Jesus. She received Jesus five years ago, <laughs> only three years after her and John were married. Do you mean there has not been a change in Mary since she's been born again? Well, yes, there has been some change. She now believes that she would go to heaven if she died. But she still lives under constant condemnation because she feels so bad about her behavior that she seems to have no ability to control. She does have some hope now, whereas she had no hope before she met Jesus. She was miserable and hopeless. Now she is just miserable. It's one thing to be a miserable sinner. It's another entirely different thing to be a miserable saint. And I have been both. Mary knows that her attitude's wrong. She wants to change. She's received counseling from two different people. Takes every opportunity to be prayed for. Asks for victory over anger, rebellion, unforgiveness, resentment, and bitterness. Why has she not seen any improvement? <laughs> well, the answer is found in Romans 12 verse 2. So let's go there and read that before we go any further. Do not be conformed to this world, fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed, entirely changed, by the entire renewal of your mind. Be changed by the renewal of your mind. We are saved by the blood of Jesus. We are changed by the power of the Holy Ghost and the renewal of our mind. When you get saved, your mind doesn't get saved. You do get a new mind. You get a mind of the Spirit. You get the mind of Christ. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But it still has to be developed. It's something that's down deep inside of you. Old habit patterns have to be broken. Strongholds have to be torn down. How many people receive Christ as their Savior? They're sincere. They pray a prayer of salvation with somebody. They want to turn their life around, but they never really educate themselves. They don't educate themselves. There's not one person here that would ever expect to go be a doctor with no education. You would not expect to be a good dentist with no education. You would not expect to be a school teacher with no education. Not even a kindergarten school teacher would you expect to be with no education. And yet we expect to be powerhouse, victorious Christians with no education. <laughs> and it just won't work. Now, you know, you've come here tonight because you're people who want to be educated. But guess what? There's millions of other people watching this right now by TV, and many of you don't know zip about the Word of God. And if somebody asks you, you might say, well, yes, I believe in Jesus. 
But I'm telling you, even if you believe in Jesus and you sincerely believe in Jesus, if you don't know the Word of God, I mean know it, not have a little bit of head knowledge, but know it, then you have no way of being able to discern when the devil is lying to you. And if you let him lie to you, he is going to rule your life. How many years did I go to church week after week after week after week? I was on the evangelism board at my church. I went out and knocked on doors telling people about Jesus out of obligation because I wanted to work for God. I read a chapter a day in my Bible out of obligation. Didn't remember a thing I read. Didn't understand the thing that I read. And don't mean it really as any kind of an insult to the church that I went to because to be honest, they taught me a good foundation about salvation by grace. But nobody was teaching me how I could begin to act like a sane human being. I would go to church on Sunday, fight with my husband all week, yell at my kids all week, be miserable, depressed, angry, just a total mess and go back to church the next Sunday. And I tell you what, I have been on an all-out rampage for the last 37 years since God touched my life and I've learned His Word to see Christians grow up and mature so they can have what God sent Jesus to die for them to have and so we can be lights in a dark world. Amen. And I feel very passionate about it. And this is where it starts. The renewal of your mind. And it's a process that never stops. Let me tell you, in studying for this series for the last couple of weeks, and the closer I get to the conference, the more I entrench myself and study. The more I meditate on it. The more I've been reading. The more I've been thinking about this. I've been thinking about these scriptures on the mind all day long. And it has helped me. My thinking has improved by preparing to preach my message on thinking. So I always say, I'll just be happy to preach to myself. Even if you don't need it, I'll be happy to preach to me. <laughs> we have to have our minds renewed. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind that you might prove, prove for yourselves what is the good and perfect and acceptable will of God for you. I don't want to just talk about the good things that God wants me to have. I want to see them. I want them proved out in my life and I don't want to just preach to you about them. I want you to say, Joyce, I got it. I want to hear your testimonies. I've been set free. I'm a new person. My marriage has changed. My kids are different. My home is different. I've got peace in my life. Mary had a problem. <laughs> I'm sure Mary was a sweet girl that loved Jesus, but she had strongholds in her mind. And until they were broken, nothing was ever going to change for her. Well, the only way that we are ever going to win the battle in the mind is to study the Word of God. And you know, I say that over and over and over to people, and I know from experience that the more of God's Word that you really know, the more it becomes a part of you, the less trouble you are going to have with your mind. There are, new, there are no drive-through breakthroughs, I like to say, but the truth will set you free. And what I mean by that is today, we live in a society where everything can be done fast. We can drive through and get almost everything. But when it comes to having a, a a renewed mind, it's going to take a little bit of work and effort on our part. Yes, we want to pray. We want to ask God to help us. We cannot do it without Him. But it's going to require studying the Word of God. You know, if you have not really studied the Word of God, I would like to suggest that you even just start with 15 minutes a day. Don't start somewhere that's overwhelming. Start somewhere small, and pretty soon you'll be seeing such good results that you're going to want to do it on a regular basis.
We're here at the Hand of Hope Medical Clinic in Angacha, Ethiopia. And Dave, I just wanted to ask you, what, what are you feeling as you come here and see the work that God's allowing us to do? Uh, I'm feeling humbled. I'm feeling thrilled, excited about what God's given us an opportunity to do. Uh, you know, when, when I look at this place, it was a rundown wreck at one time, and now it's so beautiful. The grounds are uh, actually, they say they're therapeutic to the people here, yeah, right. and uh, the people are excited about what, what has happened here. But we're excited about what God is doing, how He's helping the people here in Mangacha, Ethiopia. We have the opportunity to yeah. help hurting people, and that's our goal, that's our desire, that's our hunger for, for Joyce Meyer Ministry. Well, one thing is for sure, we certainly love helping people and to see the smiles on the kids' faces and, and to see the hope in their parents' eyes is just a, a phenomenal blessing. I can honestly say I don't think that there's anything in the world that's better or gives you a better feeling than knowing that you're making a positive difference in somebody else's life. I love to be able to put a smile on someone's face. Thank you for helping us do that. Thank you.